Hello, my name is Alex Fung and I'm a medical student at the University of Cambridge and this is my presentation on stroke and transient ischemic attacks. Let's start off with some background. Stroke, also known as cerebrovascular accident, is the clinical syndrome resulting from the infarction of brain, spinal cord or retinal tissue due to inadequate perfusion. It is characterised by sudden onset of rapidly developing focal or global neurological dysfunction. On the other hand, transient ischemic attacks are defined as transient episodes of neurological dysfunction caused by focal brain, spinal cord or retinal ischemia without acute infarction. These were historically diagnosed based on the resolution of focal neurological symptoms within 24 hours of onset. However, imaging studies have shown that infarction is present in up to one third of patients whose symptoms resolve 24 hours. So this new tissue-based definition is now used over the original time-based definition. There are more than 110,000 strokes in the UK every year, with one case happening every three and a half minutes. One in four patients will die within a year, and one in two will be left with a permanent disability. There are various causes of stroke, and strokes are classified by their mechanism of neurological dysfunction. Ischemic strokes are caused by inadequate blood supply to an area of CNS tissue. These are by far the most common type of stroke, and account for around 85% of cases. Ischemia can result from thrombosis where a blood clot forms locally within a cerebral blood vessel, such as due to atherosclerotic plaque rupture. Ischemia can also result from embolism, such as from the heart, due to atrial fibrillation. Global cerebral ischemia can result from systemic hyperperfusion due to cardiac arrest. On the other hand, hemorrhagic strokes are caused by rupture of the blood vessel or abnormal vascular structure within the brain, such as an aneurysm or arteriovenous malformation. These account for around 15% of cases. There are two subtypes, intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. The most common cause for hemorrhagic strokes is uncontrolled hypertension. Other causes include trauma, rupture of an aneurysm or arteriovenous malformation, and arterial dissection. TIAs are most commonly due to conditions that cause embolism, such as atrial fibrillation. There are many risk factors for these conditions, which include a previous stroke or TIA, thrombophilia, cardiovascular disease, which includes angina, myocardial infarction, peripheral vascular disease, heart failure and hypertension, and also diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking, pregnancy and cocaine use. Now let's move on to the presentation of these conditions. In general, a vascular pathology should be suspected when a patient develops rapid onset neurological deficits. Symptoms develop within a few minutes. The distribution of clinical signs affects the territory of cerebral vasculature affected and is typically focal and asymmetrical. Therefore, to understand the various presentations of a stroke, it is important for you to first understand a bit about the anatomy of the blood supply to the brain. The anterior circulation is made up of the internal carotid arteries and its branches, whilst the posterior circulation is made up of the vertebral arteries and its branches. The Bamford classification system can be used to identify the area of brain tissue affected in ischemic strokes. Total anterior circulation strokes involve a large cortical stroke affecting the territories of the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. These are indicated when all three of the following are present. A motor or sensory deficit in two or more of the face, arm and leg, homonymous hemianopia, and higher cortical dysfunction, which includes dysphasia and visuospatial disorder. Partial anterior circulation strokes are a less severe form of total anterior circulation strokes, where only part of the anterior circulation is compromised. These are indicated when two of the previous criteria are present. Posterior circulation strokes involve the territory of posterior circulation, such as the cerebellum and brainstem. These are indicated when any of the following are present. Ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy combined with contralateral motor or sensory deficit, bilateral motor or sensory deficit, 
disordered conjugate eye movements, cerebellar dysfunction, which includes ataxia, nystagmus, and vertigo, and isolated homonymous hemianopia or cortical blindness. Finally, lacuna strokes are caused by small infarcts resulting from small vessel disease of the deep penetrating arteries that supply subcortical areas. Areas affected include the internal capsule, chordates, putamen, thalamus and brainstem. These are indicated when any of the following are present. A pure motor stroke, pure sensory stroke, sensory motor stroke and ataxic hemiparesis. The TIA should be suspected if a patient presents with ischemic stroke-like symptoms that completely resolve within 24 hours of onset and cannot be explained by another condition such as hypoglycemia. Most TIAs last for more than one minute and less than one hour. Note that global events such as syncope and dizziness are unlikely to represent a TIA. The features of a hemorrhagic stroke again depend on the area of brain tissue affected. In addition, they are more likely to present with global features, such as confusion and meningism, which includes headache, neck stiffness, photophobia, nausea and vomiting. However, it is important to note that these features are relatively non-specific for hemorrhage. So in particular, subarachnoid hemorrhage should be suspected in anyone presenting with sudden severe headache and altered neurological state until proven otherwise. Important differential diagnoses or so-called stroke mimics to exclude are hypoglycemia, Todd's palsy, which is weakness after a seizure, syncope, sepsis, migraine, intracranial tumours and drug or alcohol abuse. Now let's move on to the investigations. Stroke is a diagnosis that must be confirmed using imaging as estimating regions of brain infarction using clinical signs alone is inaccurate. TIA, likewise, is a diagnosis that can only be confirmed once brain infarction is excluded on imaging. The most important investigation is a non-enhanced CT head. This is used not only to identify affected brain regions, but also to exclude hemorrhage. CT should be performed immediately and definitely within one hour where suspected acute stroke of any of the following apply. There are indications for thrombolysis or thrombectomy. The patient is taking anticoagulants or has a known bleeding tendency. There is a GCS score of less than 13. Unexplained progressive or fluctuating symptoms. Epilodema, neck stiffness or fever. Or a severe headache at the onset of symptoms. If there are no such indications for immediate imaging, CT should still be performed as soon as possible and definitely within 24 hours. It is no longer recommended by NICE to offer CT to people with suspected TIA unless there is clinical suspicion of an alternative diagnosis that CT could detect. As shown on the left, an ischemic stroke appears to be a wedge-shaped hypoattenuation or dark area of brain tissue. We can also see loss of grey matter, white matter differentiation and sulcal effacement. Hyperattenuation, or brightness within an artery, indicates a clot. On the other hand, a hemorrhagic stroke appears as a large hyperdense lesion. Acute bleeding appears bright white, and the longer the blood has been present, the darker it appears. In the middle, we can see an intracerebral hemorrhage, and on the right, we can see subarachnoid hemorrhage. An MRI scan of the brain with diffusion-weighted sequences is more sensitive than CT at detecting acute infarct and may be taken on the same day as the initial CT head. Bloods are taken to help identify risk factors and rule out differentials and include an FBC, fusenese, LFTs, glucose, lipids and clotting. An ECG trace is taken to check for atrial fibrillation. A chest x-ray and echocardiogram are used to check for signs of hypertension or atrial fibrillation. An urgent carotid Doppler scan is also taken to check for the level of clotted artery stenosis in patients considered for carotid endarterectomy. Finally, a CT or MR angiography should be performed after the initial non-enhanced CT head if thrombectomy is considered or if there are signs of subarachnoid hemorrhage.
Let's end by looking at the management of these patients. Initial assessment of a suspected acute stroke should include the primary survey. Outside hospital, a validated source such as the FAST should be used to screen people with sudden onset of neurological symptoms for stroke or TIA. In addition, hypoglycemia should be excluded. All suspected cases of stroke should be immediately admitted to a specialist acute stroke unit. The patient's airway should be protected, but oxygen should only be given if the SATs are less than 95%. Monitor the patient's glucose, oxygen SATs, blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, temperature and ECG. Treat any hypoglycemia. Establish venous access and take bloods. The patient should be milled by mouth and given IV fluids for hydration until a bedside swallow screen is performed. It is important to take a focused history from the patient and, if possible, from a witness. Focus particularly on when did the symptoms start, try to get an exact time, are symptoms worsening, static or improving, does the patient have any intracranial pathology, clotting problems, bleeding, such as gastrointestinal or vaginal, pregnancy, recent trauma, surgery or thrombolysis. The patient should also be examined, documenting any neurological deficits. An urgent CT head should be requested to exclude hemorrhage as discussed previously. If there are no signs of hemorrhage on CT, there are a few treatment options to consider immediately. 300 milligrams of aspirin taken daily. Thrombolysis with alteplase if the onset of symptoms lies within four and a half hours ago. There are many contraindications to thrombolysis, as shown, and it requires a CT head to be taken 24 hours post lysis to exclude bleeds. Intraarterial mechanical thrombectomy can provide additional benefit to patients with occlusion of the proximal anterior circulation confirmed by CT or MR angiography. The blood glucose of these patients should be kept between 4 and 11, and to preserve cerebral perfusion, Hypertension should only be treated if thrombolysis is considered or if there is a hypertensive emergency, such as encephalopathy or aortic dissection. As for stroke, the primary survey and FAST test is used in the acute setting for a TIA. It should be noted that a patient with ongoing focal neurological deficits despite a negative FAST test should be managed as acute stroke rather than TIA. Historically, Patients with a suspected TIA were admitted to hospital based on their ABCD2 score, which predicted the seven-day risk of having a stroke following a suspected TIA. However, new guidance by NICE in 2019 states that all patients with suspected TIA should be referred urgently, i.e. within 24 hours, without using such risk scoring systems, to a specialist stroke physician for assessment. Meanwhile, the patient should be given 300 mg of aspirin immediately unless contraindicated. Once the diagnosis of stroke or TIA has been confirmed, it is important to start secondary prevention. All modifiable risk factors should be controlled. Aspirin should be continued for two weeks and then switched to a long-term antithrombotic agent such as clopidogrel. Anticoagulation should be given to patients after stroke secondary to atrial fibrillation and carotid endarterectomy can be performed within two weeks of the first presentation if a carotid Doppler scan demonstrates at least 70% stenosis and there is acceptable operative risk. Finally, rehabilitation is essential and must be started early to maximise quality of life and prevent complications resulting from immobility, including pressure sores, aspiration pneumonia, constipation and contractures. Thank you for listening and I hope you found this presentation useful.